Hello everybody, um, this is EHA Today at uh, Cardiology Update 2017 in Davos in Switzerland. My name is Oliver Gamperli, I'm Associate Editor of the European Art Journal and I have the pleasure today to be sitting here together with uh, Professor Francesco Maisano, who is the head of the Cardiovascular Surgery Department in Zurich, Switzerland. Hello Francesco. Hi. So today we have a very interesting topic, which as I know is your specialty. We're going to talk about treatment of mitral valve repair, the journey from surgery to percutaneous treatment. And I know that you are really a unique person because you're an absolute expert in both surgical and percutaneous uh, techniques. So uh, I would like to start with the first question and ask you, what do you think if you overview the entire period of development from surgical techniques to percutaneous treatment, what do you think have been the most important milestones that we have witnessed over the last decades? Well, yeah, I think uh, it's obvious to say that uh, the most important milestone has been to be able to bring a surgical uh, procedure into a, into a catheter. I think. Uh, uh, the first example has been the MitroClip. MitroClip uh, is a device which has been already implanted in more than 40,000 patients worldwide. And uh, this is basically the uh, natural evolution of a surgical procedure which was designed to be simple. Usually surgery is meant to become with time more complicated, you know, every evolution of surgery has been in, in, in the direction of being more complex to address more complex problems. While uh, Alfieri was in, in his, uh, uh, at that time, was really an innovator trying to find a simpler solution to, comple to, to address complex problems. And this simple solution, since day one, we had the feeling that it would be possible to reproduce through a minimal invasive approach, even through a cater. So this was the first time we, we put this in, into a paper, was 1998. So at that time, nobody would think about uh, really these things. What is now uh, happening just more recently, I think uh, uh, in the last two, three years, we have seen expansion of uh, opportunities. And I think this is the second milestone. Uh, there is uh, a, a growing number of, of uh, uh, technical solutions in search for an indication still. Uh, but I think this is also, uh, we are entering a new era. There is not only MitroClip, there is now a, a little toolbox. Maybe the toolbox will become bigger, but we wait for, uh, for uh, the next steps. Many people are maybe comparing the development in the field of mitral valve treatment with the TAVI field, where we also started with surgery and now we have a percutaneous device to treat the disease. Do you see parallels in these developments or do, do you think this is a very dis, uh, different movement? No, there are parallels and di divergence, uh, divergent things. I think uh, what is parallel is that uh, there is a uh, potential which has been shown in one device and then there is a, a exponential growth of users and of, uh, of uh, technical solutions. The difference between uh, a TAVI and, uh, and any mitral implantation, uh, either repair, repair or replacement, is that uh, the diversity of uh, the mitral disease makes uh, uh, the solution that one size fits all not possible. So there is more room for uh, diversity in the mitral space, there is more room for innovation, there is more room for I inventivity, and at the same time, which is the bad part of it, there is more room for uh, improvisation and less room for standardization. So this has made uh, the mitral space to run slower than expected. Uh, it is less easy to identify the right patients, to train the, the operators. There are a lot of challenges which are not the same as for the aortic valve. Not, uh, uh, not secondary, also the disease we are treating. The aortic valve is a, ma a very simple disease, is a, is a binary disease, let's say. It is, there is aortic stenosis or there is not aortic stenosis. While mitral insufficiency is a little bit more complicated to define and to identify 
the sweet spot of uh, therapy. This is, I think, very important and probably this is why we have this large toolbox that you mentioned before with solutions, percutaneous solutions for uh, repair of the, of the mitral valve. Now, um, if we oversee these developments, we see two um, ways of development. One way is to go for the prosthesis and one way is the repair in the percutaneous field. And uh, I mean, you, I know you have been also involved in, in uh, the field of uh, percutaneous prosthesis. Where do you think are we heading? Which way is the correct one? Should we invest in developing prosthesis or do you think at the end what will stay is actually the percutaneous repair techniques that are on the market? So uh, you should ask this question uh, one year ago. The investments have been all in, uh, in the area of uh, replacement uh, one year ago, there has been a kind of crazy summer where all uh, big corporates have been investing tons of millions in uh, in uh, in, uh, in replacement. Uh, replacement brings uh, uh, the expectation of being more standardized, uh, being more predictable, easy, easier to learn and to apply in clinical practice. And I think uh, you know if you look at what happened in surgery 40 years ago. Uh, or 50 years ago when the first uh, uh, prosthesis were becoming available, the surgeons slowly they abandoned all repair techniques to uh, embrace the replacement, uh, which was again more reproducible. Uh, some, there were some open issues regarding the biocompatibility of these devices, but at the end surgeons were very happy with replacement until somebody was able to rejuvenate the repair. And how repair became against, again the, the, the first option was by establish, establishing center of excellence. Now in, in this field, I think there is a big difference here anyhow. What happens now is that uh, different from what expected, the replacement business has been much slower than, uh, than predicted. To date, there are no more than 200, 250 patients treated with replacement worldwide with different devices. And uh, just to make a comparison, we talk about mitral, but you know, the sister, the little sister is tricuspid. And tricuspid worldwide, tricuspid started after replacement. There are much more cases done by, uh, in, in the tricuspid space than in mitral valve replacement. So I think there will be a role for repair. But this will probably uh, endanger as soon as some uh, replacement device will become available. It will be in danger, and probably only a few uh, centers will really focus on repair, uh, struggling on some uh, bad outcomes or let's say not, uh, not effective re reduction of MR. Uh, but it's difficult to beat the safety profile of repair. So we are slowly coming to an end and uh, with your experience I think what uh, would interest our, uh, our, um, our uh, uh, spectators most is where we will be in 10 years. What is your guess where will we be, how will we be treating mitral valve disease in 10 years from now? So I don't know because uh, if I knew I would be a good investor. So what I think, uh, I have a dream and I think what is my vision is that we will apply the best technique and the best technology for the individual patients. In my opinion, in the area, in, in, the, in this field, the, what, most of the patients today we treat with mitral clip probably in 10 years time will be ideal candidates for replacement. We do a lot of uh, end stage functional MR patients where probably replacement is a better option. And, uh, on the other hand, I think there is a big role for repair procedures earlier in the, sta in the stage of disease. So both for functional and the genetic MR, I think repair will play an important role. And we will be progressively selecting devices which are uh, uh, delivering a, a smaller footprint on the, on the mitral valve, meaning that you don't close the door to eventually in upscaling, or uh, namely uh, uh, mitral clip or replacement. So I think annuloplasty will become more and more uh, adopted. Today is not uh, the central uh, device, 
because I think Mitagip still plays an important role in terms of uh, uh, versatility. Uh, it is very intuitive device, but uh, as Enio Plus it will hit uh, uh, the market, uh, people will learn how to use it and probably has the potential, particularly in the early stage FMR, to become uh, first line. Okay, thank you very much. So if I may summarize, I think we're truly witnessing very exciting times in the field of mitral valve disease and mitral valve treatment. And uh, we are not sure what the future will bring us, but it's truly exciting to be able to follow these developments. So thank you very much, Professor Francesco Maizano. This was EHJ Today. Thanks for watching.